Today we're going to do our lecture on ecclesiology. So let's uh, get started in this. Uh, in the in the uh, history throughout the history of Christianity, uh, one of the areas where there's been a lot of disagreement, and probably we this is very evident today in the churches, is in the uh, structure of the church or an understanding of exactly what the church is and how it should function. And uh, so historically, this has been a problem, and as the slide says here. Um, few areas have less agreement than ecclesiology. This is true also within evangelicalism. So not only have there been the major distinctions and the major breaks that we've seen with uh, Catholicism and the Reformation and the Orthodox churches, even within, within evangelicalism, we've got some, some fairly large distinctions. And even with the landmark controversy, Southern Baptists have our own share of disagreements concerning the church. And we're dealing with that even today on issues of governance. We're seeing that uh, pop up in Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist circles. Now, Baptists gen generally are distinguished from other churches primarily, primarily by our structures of our churches, by our ecclesiological convictions. For most students, this is where you're going to serve, so that's one of the reasons why we want to focus on the church as much as we will. And so that's uh, why discussing the church is important. First thing we're going to talk about is the nature of the church. So what is the church exactly? What are we talking about? What makes uh, something the church and something else not the church? Well, Wayne Grudem says the church is the community of all true believers of all time. So... In this sense, Grudem is talking about the idea of the, the church universal, or all believers at all time. So the church is the group of people who are genuine believers, are true believers in Jesus Christ. The Concise Dictionary of Christian Theology defines the church as those who are true believers in Christ. The term is used in the New Testament in both a universal sense, all such believers, and in a restricted sense, a particular group of believers gathered in one place. So Grudem's definition is definitely focusing on the universal aspect, but the church, as we often use it in common language, often refers to a particular group of believers at a particular place. So that's important for us to realize. Westminster Dictionary defines the church uh, as the community of those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, it is used in a limited sense for local communities and in a universal sense for all believers. So again, understanding we can talk about the church generally and universally, or specifically as in a particular local church. The, the word ecclesia comes from two Greek, Greek words, meaning called out, and was originally used in the Greek city-states for assembling the citizens. You'd call them out to conduct the business of the city. So uh, you would call an assembly to do uh, things that the city needed to have done to make decisions. That's kind of the basis of the word. 114 times this word is used in the New Testament. Three times in a secular sense, twice to refer to the Old Testament, to people of God, and the rest for the church. Uh, look, just talking about the, uh, the two senses of the word church, only a few times is the word church used uh, to refer to the universal church in the Bible. Okay, we've got them listed here. Uh, so most of the time, there, the word ecclesia is referring to the local church, the particular group of people. Okay, it says uh, the local assembly of baptized believers who meet for the purpose of fulfilling the functions and ordinances of a church. So, and often you'll see churches talking about a region, so a plural form there. Uh, it is important to note here, a local church is not merely a part of the body of Christ, it is a local manifestation of the body of Christ. So, in one sense, yes, we are all part of the body of Christ, but each church is the body of Christ also. So, we shouldn't think of ourselves only as 
parts, but as the church itself, we are also the whole. Um, or the whole is probably not the best way to, to describe it, but a complete representation of the body of Christ in each local context. So we shouldn't think that you know that we are the navel and someone else is the big toe, and that without uh, all of the different churches throughout the world, that we're not the body of Christ. Each local congregation is itself the body of Christ, and uh, even though we are different sizes and all of those kind of things. So, all right. Um, a couple of it's important for us to, to think about not only what the church is and what makes up the church, but sometimes to uh, to do that we need to think about what the church is not. So it is not as we've got here. Judaism improved and continued. So there is a connection between the saved of all ages, but uh, Christianity is not new wine poured in old wineskins. Um, so this position distinguished the Anabaptists from the Reformers there, uh, not seeing just a continuation of Judaism here in the church. Uh, it's not the kingdom of God. Uh, this is the position of the, the Roman Catholic, Catholic Church and other uh, millennialists. Uh, Jesus preached that the kingdom of God was near, not the church. The kingdom creates the church. The church witnesses to the kingdom. The church is instrument, an instrument of the kingdom. And the church is the custodian of the kingdom. But the church is not equal to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is, is greater than that. So um, that is uh, the position there. Uh, the church is not in union with the state. Um, this is important for us as Baptists particularly because the, the state is enforcing its rules with the sword. And the church, if it, if it becomes united with the state, there can be a tendency to enforce its, want to enforce the church's rules with the sword. And we see that that's, we have had a problem with that as Baptists. So, because the church is not the same as Judaism in the sense that you had a monarchy there, and so you had a close connection between the Jewish state and the Jewish political structure, and because the church is not the kingdom of God exactly, then there must be some difference between the church and the secular government. So we we need to be careful of that, and we've seen places historically where that has gone very badly when the church has found itself aligned with the state and uh, used tried to use the state to enforce its rules, and then sometimes the state used the church to, uh, to accomplish things that uh, were not necessarily aligned with the church's mission. So, uh, as Baptists, we, we certainly focus on the idea of separating the church and the state. Uh, the church is not a building. Uh, earliest churches, of course, met in homes. And so we often talk about the church and we refer to the building. It's important for us to realize that may be something we do out of convenience, but some people will say it's the church house to make that distinction and to keep it uh, clear. That the church are the people, is the people, not the, are, it's not the building. And the church is not a denomination. So it's not, uh, Southern, we're not the Southern Baptist Church, we're the convention because we realize that uh, the church is either the universal sense of the church or the local manifestations of the church, but denominations which are extra or supra, uh, you know, they're larger than, they're a conglomeration of churches and that's not itself a church. So, um, that's important to keep that distinction. Looking at the founding of the church and when it happened, if different views did take different uh, understandings of, of when exactly the church happened, covenant theology, uh, Grudem explains uh, this process by where Christ builds a church is just a continuation of the pattern established by God in the Old Testament where he called people to himself to be a worshiping assembly before him. So in covenant theology, you see the the idea that Jesus is calling people, and so the church is, is formed there at the call uh, when he is calling those people in uh, to himself, and it follows very much the same kind of pattern 
that you see in the Old Testament. Dispensationalism sees that the church begins at Pentecost. Uh, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. He did not say he would continue to add something already in existence, but he would do something not yet begun. That's Ryrie's take on that. So for dispensationalists, the church begins at Pentecost. So it's not the church is not in existence when Jesus is ministering and Jesus is on earth. In fact, until Pentecost, after he's departed, um, it, or after he is, after the crucifixion, rather, and resurrection, the church still isn't is in existence until Pentecost, in a dispensational view. Landmarkism uh, is a view that's held uh, implicitly by many Baptists, and some are very aware of it. Uh, J.R. Uh, Graves and J.M. Pendleton are some of the founders and leaders in this movement. Um, they claim that John the Baptist actually founded the church, and they base that on Carol's trail of blood, and some of you are familiar with that. We'll look at a picture of that in just a minute. Landmarkism contends that the true church can trace their origin back to the church at Jerusalem by Baptist succession. So here we have an idea in Landmarkism and in certain other Baptist uh, successionist traditions that the church is either founded by John the Baptist or even some very odd, going back to Adam, and would claim that the church has been in succession and has existed since then. Here is the trail of blood. Some of you, you'll see this in your Baptist heritage class, and you'll go through that. And um, The idea is through all of the centuries of the church, all these things are going on, only the red are genuine believers. But you see up here, <clears throat> you've got hierarchy, uh, which is as Catholic, and then... Um, Greek Catholic, Roman Catholic, the split there, and then going on out of the Roman Catholic branch, you see the Reformation with Lutherans, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and all these others that have broken off of there. And underneath, uh, on the bottom, you see uh, some of these schismatic groups that are there, and then you start to see more of a continuous red dot through all of this timeline. And so the idea was, all of the red dots were actually... Baptist churches, though they didn't call themselves that, they were essentially the same as Baptist churches, and that we have continued from that. And so the genuine church has always been there. That we didn't come out of the Reformation, we didn't come out of the Catholic Church. We always existed before, uh, before them. And uh, and then the the interesting thing is, only the red parts are genuine believers too. You know that that's that's an important part of it. Um, so. Um, or genuine churches, probably, is a better way to put that. Um, but, you know, this is this is a problematic uh, view here. Of course, it's throwing out all of church history uh, as being somewhat of, of a sham. So, um, this is, however, what was used to try to defend... Baptist churches, and and this is a play on or a reinterpretation of the idea of apostolic succession that the Catholic Church uses. It says the Catholic Church is legitimate. Why? Because of the apostles and their successors. And the Catholic Church has the successors of the apostles, and going on throughout history, each you could trace directly back to the apostles. And so the Baptist says, well, hey, we're going to take that idea, and we're just going to make it into church succession. And so that's what you get here. And, and uh, anyway, it's it is uh, somewhat troubling to to look at. And um, when you start looking at the teachings of some of these groups that are identified as actual Baptists, they would be very very different from what we would identify as um, as Baptists. So it's troubling to say the least. A Baptist view of the church sees that uh, the church is founded by Christ during his earthly ministry, but empowered on the day of Pentecost. And often you'll see Ezekiel 37 used as an illustration for that. So the church is actually founded by Jesus and empowered by him, uh, or by the Spirit rather, <coughs> at Pentecost. So it doesn't see that it is founded at Pentecost where there is a time after Jesus has died where the church does not exist. Um, what about the relationship to Israel? Well, you've got a couple of views here. 
in covenant theology, the church is the new Israel and includes both the Old Testament and New Testament believers. Uh, the church is the, the community of true believers of before all time. I'm going back to group. So the church then is replacing Israel and functions as God's people in the current uh, in the current time. And so um, that view is one which does not see any future role for Israel in uh, in the eschaton. And so we'll touch on eschatology in the next lecture, but in, in covenant theology, it's important for us to realize that the uh, the ethnic Jewish state is not seen as having any significant role to play, and everything that was promised to God's people is applied to the church, who are God's people post uh, resurrection. And so you can point to Jesus's teachings that the true that the true Israel and those who really belong to God are his followers, and so there seems to be in the Gospels then a very clear distinction. Those who should have followed Jesus didn't, and so they have, would no longer be entitled to uh, their, their covenant, to their, that they're not the genuine Israel, the real Israel are, are those who are the church. And so that's part of the way covenant theology picks up with that. Dispensational thought theology takes a much different approach and sees the church as completely and permanently distinct from Israel. So this would see that, that Israel is still God's chosen people. The church is something that's going on now, but at some point uh, the church will no longer be around and God will finish what he had started in the Old Testament with Israel. So the church and Israel are completely different items and different things altogether. A progressive dispensationalism sees that the church is distinct from Israel, but God has only one purpose for both in the eternal state. So in a uh, classical type of dispensationalism, you might have a place for the church and a place for Israel eternally, but in a progressive dispensationalism, they both have a single purpose eternally. There, there may be t differences in time and distinctions now where the church is not the same as Israel, but uh, in the final thing, everybody's going to be in heaven together is kind of the idea, rather than there being a place for Israel and a place for the church. What makes up the church? Well, um, or, or what is the constitution of the church? And what, it, what is it? What different pictures do we see for the church in the Bible? We see several. Uh, we're going to look at five of them. Uh, the first is the people of God. So we see that um, life in the church is in common with Christ and his people. It is life in a new sphere which brings a new relationship and duties. We are God's possession, sharing in his nature, life and protection. We see the references uh, to uh, 2 Corinthians and 1 Peter there. So the church are the people of God. The church is the people of God. Uh, and it is the body of Christ. Sometimes this is seen as kind of the most basic metaphor, but it's unique to Paul. The members are interconnected and dependent, as a body has different parts that are connected and dependent. And Jesus is the head of the church and the final authority over the church. But the body of Christ is a common way of describing the church, what it is. Now, we're also, though, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That metaphor is used of the individual believer in 1 Corinthians 6.18, but appears to be used of the church as a whole in 1 Corinthians 3.16. So, a place for God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell. So, that is another picture of the church, a metaphor of the church, if you will. Uh, the vine and the branch, John uh, 15, gives us that uh, picture. Jesus is the true vine, and we are the branches. We must stay in the vine for life, and so we're probably familiar with that. That's another way to, to kind of view the church. And then finally is the bride of Christ. Uh, there's a singleness of love, devotion, and commitment which Christ has toward his church. 
marriage is a particular and exclusive love, and so we, we can see the uh, pictures that go along with that as well. So we're probably familiar with these terms, but now we've got some references uh, for them and see that that's different descriptors of the church. Moving along, what's the role of the church? What is the church supposed to do? I really think Grudem does a good job of describing this. There's three purposes of the church. Uh, ministry to God, which is worship. Ministry to believers, which is nurturing. And then ministry to the world, which is evangelism and mission. So um, we should serve or minister to God. We are appointed to do that. And um, we are to, to praise God and worship God. That's part of what the church is to do. It's not the whole of what the church is to do, but it's part of it. So we are to worship God. So our worship is important that we do that. Ministry to believers or the nurturing aspect. We are to uh, bring people up to be mature, to teach, and to have time to build relationships with one another. And so we have uh, that responsibility as a church also to nurture, provide a good environment, and provide different uh, things that are needed to bring people into the type of relationship, of mature relationship with Christ and one another. So we have ministry to God, worship. We have ministry to believers, nurture. We have ministry to the world, and that's evangelism and mercy. So evangelism is, uh, of course, sharing the gospel and uh, and calling people to faith and repentance. And so there's that aspect. Baptists see that the Great Commission has been given to the church. That's the responsibility of the church to share the gospel. And so evangelism is one way that we interact with the world, but it's also mercy. The church has an obligation to show mercy both to those in and out of the whole household of faith. So we need to take care of our own in the church. That's part of the nurturing process, but it's also merciful. And then we need to show mercy outside of the church. So alleviate, alleviating suffering, trying to, to do things that will help promote the good and, uh, and, and eliminating suffering are things that we should do. Now, how do we keep those purposes in balance? And this is where I like to have somewhat of an extended discussion, balancing those purposes. And uh, what I'll simply say now, and we can talk about it in the lecture or in the classroom time, is that typically, in my view, churches tend to overemphasize one of the three, either the worship, the ministry to the world, or ministry to the church. And if you overemphasize one of the three, it keeps you out of balance. If you focus, for example, if you focus exclusively on ministry to the world and you neglect uh, other things, then you could have perhaps ministries that, that generate a lot of activity and you might have a lot of people that recite prayers and might maybe that's resulting in conversions, maybe not, but you may have very little in the way of a vibrant worship experience. And experience is not the right word there, but a vibrant worship ministry where God is being properly worshipped. Or you may have a church that's filled with people that have no theological grounding. And I've seen that where the focus is so much on evangelism and there's no discipleship. There's no making of disciples. At the same time, you could focus on making disciples and have no evangelism. Or you could focus on your worship and have no teaching or no evangelism that, that focuses, that works on that. So we've got to figure a way to, um, balance these. So what I recommend that you do is you think about in your individual ministry context, what do we do? How many activities and how much resources and how much time do we devote to things that are the worship of God, things that are nurturing the church, things that are um, evangelism and mercy, reaching to the world, and make sure that we've got a pretty good balance there so that we don't uh, tend to drift in one direction or another. So if we are balanced, then we'll be healthier, and we'll have 
uh, evangelism, but it, evangelism that makes disciples, not just makes converts or makes people that have prayed prayers, and that leads to proper worship, and uh, and then proper worship that leads to discipleship and leads to evangelism and things like that. So anyway, uh, we can certainly discuss that in class, but I want to encourage you to consider that. Uh, considering the government of the church or governance of the church, so there's a couple of different forms of church government. Episcopalianism is government by a bishop. Uh, this is hierarchical, um, and it has a very sharp distinction between the laity and the clergy. So this is the kind of um, church structure we see, of course, in the Catholic Church, and the Episcopal Church would make sense. Uh, that there are those who have the authority, and there's a clear distinction between those and the laity. They make the decisions. The laity is obliged to simply follow them. Okay, so Episcopalianism, you have a bishop, and then you have uh, different hierarchical structures there. Presbyterianism is government by elders, so a church would have a plurality of elders in uh, most likelihood, depending on the size, and those elders would be responsible to the congregation, uh, to the people, but they would actually be empowered to make decisions. So the uh, elders may be selected by the church body, but the elders actually make the decisions. Within denominations, you can have different groups of elders at different levels, um, a succession of bodies there that kind of go up to some kind of a national or international organization. And in congregationalism, this is what most Baptists are familiar with. It's government by the congregation. So Hammett writes, while there is a valid role for leaders within the church and a need to manifest the larger body of Christ, I believe such requirement can be best met within a congregational government, which preserves the principle of the priesthood of all believers and the autonomy of the local church in a way that the first two forms do not. So the local congregation, most Baptist churches are congregational. So we have empowered, or we believe that the best way to have God bring about his will within the church is through the membership of the church, through the believers, the, the members. And so the church then makes its own decisions. It's not responsible to the convention. So other Baptist churches are not, uh, don't have to answer to the convention. They are free, autonomous churches, and they make their own decisions because we're congregationalist. We tend to, we have that. Now, we, we have some movements within some of our churches to be more of an elder model, and sometimes we've got churches that have elders that make the majority of the decisions, and the congregation just makes limited decisions. I think that's still congregationalism, but, you know, at some point you could blur the lines there and uh, different things like that. So uh, we have those as another uh, another form of, a way of, of having the government together. And I do think, and we may want to discuss this in class, a, a discussion about churches that uh, have multiple locations and uh, what that looks like. And so if someone wants to bring that question up in class, what about those who have multiple campuses and have a single uh, kind of uh, very notariable, or no, I'm sorry, excuse me, excuse me, uh, recognized, popular, um, a pastor that is almost like a celebrity and uh, one that has a lot of notoriety and has several different churches that are geographically spread apart either in a city or in a region or something like that. So if there's a question about how we ought to look at that kind of, how we would classify that kind of church, is it congregational? Is it is it Episcopal? Uh, so something like a franchise, how do we how do we uh, characterize that? That's a good question that we can explore in our class time. Uh, continuing uh, is looking at the offices of the church. We see pastor, elder, and bishop are terms that refer to the leadership of the church and the offices and uh, sometimes are used interchangeably, interchangeably excuse me uh, the pastor uh, the, the Greek word is poimen the elder presbyteros 
and the bishop is Episcopos. So we can see how we've gotten some of these forms of church names uh, or church government systems from these. Uh, but these are terms that are often used interchangeably, so there doesn't need to be necessarily a clear distinction there. Uh, and then we have the office of deacon or deaconess, and uh, that's given to assist those in positions of leadership. And so there is a discussion about whether the reference to deacons are simply males or whether those that are being looked at sometimes described as the wives of deacons are actually uh, seen are actually female deacons. So, you know, you can take that to your New Testament class and argue that. Uh, authority of church and state. The uh, civil government should not enforce laws requiring or prohibiting kinds of church doctrine or abridging people's freedom to worship as they choose. This is very much a Baptist view that the church, the church's authority is separate than the, the authority of the state. So the civil government should not mess with the church and uh, should allow the church to function as she desires. And that's important uh, for a lot of Baptists. And, and I think that's, a, that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. Many the reason in the United States we have the uh, the freedom of religion is because of Baptists in Virginia. So that's important. To, if you haven't had your Baptist heritage class, then uh, you know when you get to there, look at that and see why it was important for Baptists to fight for the idea that we don't need to have a church that is authorized by the state. The church needs to be independent of the state. So, anyway, I want to push you to, to look at that. Church discipline. Um, we're going to look at what Grudem has written here in his text. Um, the purpose of church discipline is restoring and reconciliation of the one that's going astray. We've got a quote from Hammond again. It should be noted that church discipline does not apply to the weak one who falls, but to the sinful one who rebels and refuses to acknowledge and repent of sin. Once repentance happens, church discipline ceases. So church discipline is not punitive. It is restorative, okay? It's not to punish, it is to reconcile. And it's to keep sin from spreading to others, to deal with sin, to protect the church, the purity of the church, and the honor of Christ. So it's there for correction, not for punishment. So that's an important aspect. So when should we uh, exercise church discipline when serious matters cannot be resolved privately? Um, when serious sins are publicly known or outwardly evident and had continued over a period of time, the examples of sin subject to church discipline in the New Testament are diverse. We've got divisiveness, incest, laziness, refusing to work, disobeying what Paul writes, blasphemy, and teaching heretical doctrine. So, divisiveness, we like that. Someone who causes divisions or strife, that's a, a reason for church discipline. So, um, we need to not be afraid to use church discipline and understand all that we're doing in church discipline. All that we can do is, at, at the end, is remove someone from fellowship and then treat them as a uh, lost person. So there's not a whole lot that we can do. You know, we're not talking about jailing somebody or fining somebody. We're talking about evangelizing someone as if they're lost if they fail to repent, which seems to make sense. So we should be careful that we uh, are aware of what's going on in our church and that we take appropriate me measures of church discipline when it is appropriate. How should it be carried out? Um, the knowledge of the sin should be kept in the smallest group uh, possible, seems to be the purpose of Matthew 18. In other words, you don't want to just bring something up to everybody at first. You want to try to deal with something you know about in, in the smallest group that you can with just a couple of people. If you can resolve it there, then that's great. If you can't resolve it there, then you need to bring it to the church or bring it to successively larger groups of people until it comes to the body itself and the church may have to move the person, remove the person from the body. Uh, what about church leaders? Paul teaches there should be special caution to protect elders from ta attacks, but those who persist in sin are to be rebu rebuked in the presence of all. How much should church, uh, the church be told? Grudem gives some helpful guidelines. 
Uh, they should be taught enough that they'll understand how serious the offense was. They understand the support and the, understand and support the discipline process, and they will not feel like the sin was minimized or covered up if more details come out later. So, unfortunately, we have to deal with issues of that sort. So, um, anyway, that's uh, that's the approach. We're going to stop this one here, and then we'll continue uh, with baptism and the Lord's Supper, because I don't want this to uh, go on too long and cause a problem.